Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. It's really great to be here. Um, today I'd like to explore what quantum me mechanics might um, suggest about consciousness and the underlying processes of, of matter and how the two might be connected, um, which in likelihood has important implications for psi. Um, we've had a little uh, discussion that I think that I'm very grateful for, um, for the different um, interpretations. And uh, I want to um, start with what I think is a very curious and interesting feature about quantum mechanics, which in turns remains very mysterious and paradoxical. Um, currently, these are some of the primary interpretations. I won't say too much about it because uh, other speakers have said uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, they all seem to explain the same data, and they all seem to radically be radically different interpretations of our reality. And so it may be difficult to make, uh, um, it's, it's a very curious situation, it may be difficult to ma uh, make progress going forward. Um, now, here is the well-known Schrodinger equation. It so happens that the Greek symbol for the quantum wave function is usually denoted by the Greek letter psi which I think, you know, who knows, may be sort of a hint to us. Nevertheless, there's something very interesting and puzzling about the wave function that I think merits some attention, and that is that the quantum wave function appears to exist in a very, very large dimensional space. And that is the case for all the different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Now, here is uh, Sean Carroll, a well-known uh, advocate of Everett's many worlds interpretation, he justifies that particular interpretation through the very high dimensionality of the quantum wave function. But my point here is that all interpretations, Copenhagen, many worlds, hidden variables, must deal um, with this very high dimensionality of the quantum wave function. Now, um, usually when we talk about quantum mechanics and the, and the space that it operates in, Often, it's, it, the, the term that is used is configuration space, so I thought it might be good just to sort of like um, say a few words about that. Um, the term for the mathematical space used to describe the space of the quantum wave function is configuration space, which happens to be three times n dimensions, where n is the number of particles in the system. So, um, for example, one part of the ordinary three space has a configuration space of, of three dimensions. Two particles in... Uh, three-dimensional space can be alternately represented as one particle in six dimensions. Now, uh, I would have loved to have used graphics to, dis to, to display that, but it's kind of tough when you get beyond three dimensions. Now, um, you might wonder, well, what's this really useful for? Um, it turns out that although configuration has been, space has been used for a lot for classical um, physics, it seems to be necessary or essential um, to describe uh, quantum mechanics. And that's because basically of quantum entanglement. A quantum system is, can, be, can be understood to be sort of a complex whole that cannot be understood solely on the analysis of individual parts. Um, the quantum wave function itself can be understood as operating in, because of that, has to be operating in three times n dimensions. Three because of the um, possible um, spatial um, dimensions. So, one of the key questions of my talk is, what are the implications of this high dimensional space? Now, um, David Bohm, I think, uh, the physicist, was one of the first to really embrace and use the fact of the wave function existing in this high dimensional space. In Bohm's early work, um, which is known usually as hidden variables, uh, or de Broglie-Bohm um, framework, um, his guidance uh, equation depends on the position of all the particles in the system. But for Bohm, the, the system is the universe. So his guidance equation depends on the configuration of the universe. Now, this might seem like a kind of a radical step, although perhaps not necessarily as radical as the other alternatives that are on the table. Um, the challenge for Bohmian me mechanists, as is, is they're often known, that is the philosophers and physicists who follow Bohm's hidden variables framework, is how to interpret, how to think about this incredibly high number of dimensions that this requires. So Bohm's approach, unlike other alternatives, 
provides us with a way of thinking about subatomic particles that is, in some sense, uh, more congruent with our classical understanding by pushing the paradoxes of quantum mechanics into a deeper underlying strata of reality that is inherently non-local and holistic. So among the Bohmian economists and I'm sorry, mechanists and the I'm an economist, so sometimes I get mixed up. Um, the, uh, that is my day job as an economist. Um, let's see, where was I? Um, th th there's an interesting debate that's been broken out, broken out among um, people who are sort of following Bohm, and that is, what, is, what do we make of this high dimensional reality? Um, David Albert um, argues that a realistic um, view of quantum mechanics requires an understanding of the world playing out in a mind-numbingly high dimensional space, and then he proceeds to argue or try to think through what does it mean that we're in this three-dimensional space? How do we get from infinite dimensional or, or close to infinite dimensional to three-dimensional reality? Um, others, such as the philosopher Tim Maudlin, argues that that's too radical a step. Um, configuration space is best understood as a mathematical tool for defining the wave function, which in turn describes the behavior of particles in three-dimensional space. Okay, then there are others, uh, Goldstein and some of the other very influential people in uh, this literature, that argue that the quantum mechanical function can be understood as functioning in three space, while the higher dimensional properties of the configuration space of the wave function might best be interpreted to be something like laws of nature. Okay, so, um, so, so, so there we have some of the debate. Now, I like North's argument. Um, she argues that the dynamics of the wave function requires a high dimensional space. That is, while the quantum wave function operates on particles that are observed in three space, quantum states, since they're entangled, um, cannot be adequately captured with a wave function in three dimensions. North argues that our three dimensional space and all the objects contained within are real, but not fundamental. She argues that the wave function exists in a high dimensional fundamental space which is the foundation of objects in our world. So, um, so on one side of the debate, we have the view that there is a real high dimensional space that is foundational in some sense. The other side argues that this is nothing more than a mathematical space that describes the behavior of our particles in three space. So one sort of question for me that arises is, apart from the entanglements, um, within the quantum mechanical system, why should we require such a high dimensional space? Now, as, as you're probably well aware, uh, David Bohm actually took his work beyond just his hidden variables approach. Um, he didn't stop with his guidance equation and configuration space. He posited that particles such as electrons were projections of a higher dimensional reality, which he termed the implicate order. So the implicate order, um, the idea that there's this underlying strata of reality that is fundamentally holistic um, suggested a possible link with something else that is fundamentally holistic, consciousness. So Bohm proposed an implicate order as a foundation for both consciousness and matter. However, as you might sort of guess, most physicists, um, even the ones I, I was citing earlier, have, uh, are, are reluctant to take this step. Now, before we sort of like dismiss Bohm's ideas about consciousness and so forth, let's take stock of a few things. Um, first of all, um, consciousness does remain unexplained. In fact, it's a pretty hard problem. Um, no theories of consciousness are grounded in the laws of physics. Um, nothing in the laws of physics is, that we have on the books suggests how consciousness might emerge from non-conscious particles. So another stumbling block for physicists um, to try to sort of consider consciousness is, of course, it's very, the very uh, difficulty in, in, the great difficulty in defining it or analyzing it. However, um, it is nevertheless real. In fact, uh, we, because we experience it directly, it is arguably more real than a lot of, the, um, a lot of our <clears throat> particles or theories about particles that are based on um, assumptions, beliefs, and, and, and so forth. 
So, um, so um, I want to say a few more words about this, um, this idea of consciousness versus matter. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, the philosopher Galen Strawson wrote uh, an essay in the New York Times where he was uh, basically um, trying to sort of argue that um, consciousness we, we experience direct, directly, not so much matter. So what's, what's this thing about matter? What he really sort of, sort of went into is, is uh, Bertrand Russell's argument, which I want to say a few words about. Bertrand Russell, um, famous philosopher, you all know that he wasn't really a big fan of, probably not a big fan of paranormal, parapsychology, but turns out he does, does have a very influential theory um, that suggests consciousness in some sense fundamental. Russell argued that our objective knowledge of the world is based on abstract mathematical relationships and structures, but is, in, but is silent on what is the intrinsic aspect of reality, whatever the essential seed stuff is. Now, we might consider that the intrinsic aspect of reality is, in his, in his argument, is closely related to our direct experiment, experience. Um, he added that our experience of the physical world suggests consciousness and matter are actually a, a, <clears throat> alike, um, more alike than not alike. Therefore, uh, consciousness and matter may be interlinked link to a greater degree than is usually um, realized. Often philosophers have used this argument as a kind of jumping off point for some version of panpsychism. However, Russell advocated neural neutral monism. So Russell and Bohm appeared to be on the same page, uh, coming from different directions. Russell, with a phenomenological approach, um, coupled with some additional philosophical reasoning, <clears throat> and Bohm with an interpretation of quantum mechanics which stresses inherently holistic processes. So perhaps uh, the answer to the question that we raised earlier, why do we need a higher dimensional space perhaps, is to provide a ground um, or a foundation for both matter and consciousness. Thus perhaps consciousness itself requires this high dimensional space. Now, um, to explore this a little bit more fully, um, I, I think I'd like to take a little detour and consider um, Tonini's integrated information theory. Um, IIT attempts to um, develop a mathematical framework, I'm sure many of you are probably f a little bit familiar with this, if not a great deal, develop a mathematical f uh, framework for measuring the degree of consciousness that a system has. Now, to be clear, um, Tonini embraces a type of uh, panpsychism, not the kind of neutral monism that um, I've been exploring here, but I hope to explain how his framework nevertheless may give us some insights. Tonini um, notes that our um, conscious experience um, includes a wide range of different qualia, color of the carpet, uh, texture of the air, uh, sound of my voice, um, all included in an integrated whole. Underlying, um, under, <clears throat> underlying this unity is a multitude of causal interactions among relevant parts of the brain. So, IIT um, claims that consciousness exists in any system of integrated information, such as complex neural systems, biological systems. However, also perhaps, perhaps the internet as well. Okay, I can't get this word. Never mind. <laughs> so. Um, so, because it's an integrated system as well, integrated information. So it's a kind of, uh, so, so it does embrace a kind of panpsychism, okay? So ITT, IIT also um, suggests a, uh, a higher dimensional qualia space um, within this framework of integrated information. Any experience we might have is comprised as a collection of qualia. Any, um, <clears throat> and the dimension of this space depends on the possible combination of the network elements. So obviously the, the more complex the system, then the, the, the greater the dimensional space is required. So even a relatively simple organism, such as a worm, could have a, very, a, rel a fairly high uh, dimensional space. So an experience in this um, sort of relatively high dimensional qualia space would be in, in, Ton in, Tononi's, uh, in Tony's papers, he describes it as a very, very complex geometrical form comprised of various informational relationships within the system. However, to avoid confusion, I want to just add something. Um, the dimensional space we're discussing uh, earlier in quantum mechanics 
you know, three times n times the number of particles in the universe is, is, is much, much higher than what we're describing um, here based on the, uh, the, the possible combinations, it, although that is very, very high too. So I just sort of want to make note, I don't want to create any confusion. My point is, is that as we try to analyze our subjective experience in a formal information framework, um, because of its holistic nature, we, we need to sort of go in the direction of higher much higher dimensional space than three, than three space. Now here's a question though. Now, um, in a lot of ways, IIT is, has, has, been, um, has gotten a lot of in, uh, um, attention. It's gotten very, um, it's gotten very, very uh, influential. It seems to be a reasonable framework for exploring consciousness in terms of network of in information provides plausible candidates for uh, necessary conditions, but is it sufficient? I mean, after all, um, if my, it, it predicts that my cell phone is conscious. It predicts that the internet is conscious. So it, it seems like maybe some piece might be missing. You know, that's, um, that's, that's of course, something that a lot the philosophers debating um, IAT, I think, uh, um, you know, wonder about. Um, so. IIT suggests that conscious experience can be described as relationships of information, but as I suggest, we may not be able to substantiate that with actual experience. And this problem seems to me to parallel Russell's argument that our objective knowledge of matter depicts relationships of causality, but not, intrin not an intrinsic experience. So perhaps IIT requires some kind of grounding in a much higher dimensional space that could sort of fit into the dimensional space that we've been describing. Somehow, perhaps, some, something like neutral monism along the lines that Bohm and uh, Russell um, suggested. So, um, so could such a step complete Tonini's framework? I, I'm not really trying to make that argument. I don't think I've really done justice to his very sophisticated framework. I'm only trying to sort of um, glean some insights into how thinking about consciousness in a formal informational framework seems to require us to, to, to think about um, relatively high dimensions, which in turn may require uh, something like the infinite dimensional space of quantum mechanics um, and how it sort of like maybe all fits together. Um, so this sort of like leads to um, what I think is a very interesting question does our experience inhabit a much higher dimensional space? Um, does our subjective experience um, inhabit a reality considerably higher dimension than the three-dimensional space um, that, um, that we, in some sense, um, are used to? Perhaps we've sort of filtered out some aspects of reality. Well, I don't have time to sort of like explore the possible um, psi uh, implications for psi. Um, but just you know, briefly, I'll just note that Bohm's implicate order is essentially a high dimensional space is a playground of non-local, holistic, proto-conscious reality of pure potential. And I believe this is an excellent um, fra framework for understanding the, the micro psi, psi data obtained under laboratory conditions. And it could be a very rich um, framework for um, perhaps some of the micro site as well, but I'm not really prepared to speculate too much. But I think it really does give us a very sort of something to think about. Um, so um, just want to wrap up. Um, just some key points. Uh, the standard uh, quantum wave, uh, wave, wave function functions in a high dimensional space. And of course, this doesn't really depend on um, you know, the interpretation. Bohm argued that this high dimensional space is an underlying strata of reality that is non-local and inherently holistic and in later work posited as a foundation for mind and matter. And uh, as, I, as, as I just as I mentioned, I think that this interpretation of quantum mechanics and consciousness is consistent with uh, many categories of the psi data. So thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, quite a bit of time for questions here, so if people would like to come line up. Hi. Um, 
So I always thought that, right, so I always thought that, um, I guess I'm sort of a radical empiricist, so I, I, I wonder what you'll think about this. Mm -hmm. I feel like all, all, all we can be sure of empirically is consciousness, because that's all we basically, right. that's our first, everything else is inference, right? So matter mm -hmm. is inference, right? right? So isn't it easier instead of taking a neutral monist position mm -hmm. in, in terms of trying to find parallels with QM to just take an idealist position and mm -hmm. say um, so that the, the high dimensional space is more like the foundational mm -hmm. consciousness mm -hmm. and that matter is more like the actualized you know, mm -hmm. uh, evolution of the particles? Or something? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, one of the sort of like problems with maybe neutral monism is that if we sort of posit a proto-conscious you know, strata well, does that, what does that really mean? Is it conscious or is it non-conscious or is it something in between? But how can it be in between, you know? So um, I, I'm inclined, to, and, and, and William James, who, you know, is a big fan of radical empiricism, um, was also um, a fan of neutral monism, but he, his version was pure awareness. So he, he actually, and, and this isn't necessarily where, I'm not sure this is where, where everyone, but, it, but I kind of like that. I kind of like William James' version of pure awareness. It was sort of like, um, a sort of like an unfiltered um, kind of awareness that gets conditioned into our biological um, kinds of, um, you know, or, or let's say uh, an unconditional awareness that gets conditioned through, through our biology, culture, and so forth. So um, I don't have a strong statement, but it's, it's a good question that I'm not, that I still sort of like. Um, now, a lot of people shy away from idealism because I think they're just a little bit you know, the idea that is that, the mo that what, what we sort of experience with our mind seems to have a sort of unstable, much, much more unstable characteristic than what we observe when we look at matter. So I think that, so, so I think there's, there's a tendency to say, well, okay, um, if we're not looking at it, if we're not aware, does that, you know, make it go away? Um, or, um, or, 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 and so I think some people um, may, um, yeah, are, are, are a little bit reluctant with, with, with idealism, but I think that it may be that ideal, I think that neutral monism does have, at least in my view, I, I, do, a, I do like the idea of a, some kind of like maybe pure awareness that William, as William James put on the table. Since nobody else has come up to get in line, um, I'd, I'd like to offer a couple of, of comments. Uh, first, by way of a clarification, the infinite dimensional Hilbert space of quantum formalism uh, has nothing to do with the three times n dimensional configuration space that's used in problems. The Hilbert space is an abstract representation